Welcome to the Reason of Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Tuesday evening. Joined here by my co-host, Eric Ibarra, and also returning guest and former professor of mine, Professor Steve Weidenkampf. Good to have you on. Thanks How for having me, Michael. I'm doing well, always, thank you. Always a pleasure. I want to say this is your, your third time on. I know we've had you on a couple other times, so always an honor whenever our, uh, whenever we cross paths. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for having me on the show. Always, always enjoy talking uh, with you and Eric there. It's fun. And, you know, today what we're doing is we're talking about Professor Weinkampf's book here. Let me pull it up here. I should be able to see it. I'll pull up a JPEG here in a minute on the screen. The Church in the Middle Ages, and I'm going to put a link there into the description, but y'all can go to Amazon.com to check it out. And, of course, this is also published by Ave Maria Press. Uh, you can go to AveMariaPress.com to get a copy there as well. But again, it's the Church in the Middle Ages, approximately from 1000 to 1378. It's part of the uh, Reclaiming Catholic History series where we've had um, Mike Aquilina on the show talk about uh, some of the additions in this series as well. So it's continuing that series. Highly recommended. I really encourage you all to get a copy. Now, this one specifically is subtitled Cathedrals, Crusades, and the Papacy in Exile. So it kind of gives you an idea of what we're going into here. But let me ask you this, uh, Professor Weinkamp, could you maybe just start us out by just giving us a quick overview of what exactly the book is about? Why did you write it? Things like that. Sure. Yeah. So the, the book, as you um, described it there with the, the subtitle, really covers this uh, about 300, almost 400 years of history uh, in the church from the year 1000 to 1378. Um, and some might be wondering, why did we choose 13 or why did I choose 1378 to end the book instead of just rounding it off to 1400 or something like that? But um, and there's a reason for that. And I'm sure we'll get into it during the course of our discussion here. But the, there's a specific event that ends in 1378, um, which is the the you know, return of the popes from their residence in Avignon to uh, to Rome. Uh, and so I ended it there so that the next uh, volume in this series could pick up with, with uh, the popes moving back and then what happens later, which is the, the so-called Great Western Schism at the time. So, um, yeah, the book is is really, you know, kind of covers the, the high Middle Ages, if you will. Some historians describe it that way. Um, Warren Carroll called this period of time the glory of Christendom, for example. So there's a lot going on in this period of time in church history. Uh, this is a time of great military activity, hence the subtitle Crusades. There's a lot going on in the spiritual realm as well. This is when you have such uh, religious orders as the Franciscans and Dominicans coming into the forefront. Uh, and then you have also, um, you know, this is a period of great intellectual activity too. It's a time of the scholastic movement, uh, some great theologians in the church's history writing during this period of time. And it's also a time of just great artistic achievement as well, right? I mean, this is a period of time when you have the cathedrals, again, hence the subtitle uh, of these Gothic cathedrals starting off with Romanesque and then moving into Gothic or what some would term the French style of architecture. Uh, and these are magnificent monuments and edifices to you know to people's belief and faith and love in God uh, that we that it still exists today that we can go see and appreciate and uh, sadly many of them are, are kind of viewed as museums more today than than places of worship but nonetheless a testament to the great faith of people living during these these so-called high middle ages now you brought up there the Crusades. This is of a special interest to me, and I know it is to you as well because you wrote a book on this. And anybody who's interested, check out the interview that we did with the professor about the book. But can you maybe just briefly talk about that? You raised the question in the book, were the Crusaders motivated by greed? And this is something we hear a lot. Can you maybe touch on that and maybe dispel that myth for us? Yeah, sure. And, and yeah, before I get to that, just to kind of go back to what the book is about, the book gives a, I forgot to mention that, but the book gives a kind of a, a, a narrative overview of the main events and characters and story in, in a brief way uh, over these four, almost four centuries, these 400 years of church history. Uh, and, and the idea behind this series, you mentioned you had Mike Aquilina on the show, who's a series editor, and he, the way that he devised this, this uh, series was to, you know, have these volumes that break down church history into these time periods for 
for, for the average Catholic, you know, the person in the pew to be able to pick up and to read and to have a general sense narratively of what's going on in church history during these periods of time. So that's, that's the first object, objective of the series. And then after that, or, or following along with that is besides the narrative, we also have little sections within the book on dispelling certain myths uh, that people have about, you know, the church's history and, ch and people in the church during these periods of time. And you hit one uh, on the head here, Michael, in terms of the Crusades, right? I cover the crusading movement as a whole in the book. And then I, I look at uh, one particular myth about the Crusades, which is very prevalent in the world today that we still hear frequently is the reason why the Crusaders went was because they were motivated by greed, uh, you know, by an ability to acquire land and wealth and those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I think that that's a prevalent myth in our modern age because uh, so often um, people in modernity have a hard time recognizing that people in the past may have been motivated by spiritual uh, you know, desires or spiritual goods uh, or just from a position of a, you know, a faith. Um, perspective. And so medieval people, and so that's why I spent a good portion of the book, actually, the, the first part of the book, talking about the medieval worldview and what, what it was like to be a person living in that time, because we can't really truly appreciate history unless we understand it from a contemporary point of view, meaning we understand it from the point of view and the perspective of the people living during those times. Uh, you know, we do a great disservice to people in the past, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, frankly, uh, in the past by trying to take our modern view and, and imposing it on them. And that's exactly what this myth does, right? Um, you know, many historians today think, oh, there's no way that people went because of an indulgence. You know, there's no way that people went out of, you know, uh, traveled 2,000 miles away from their homes, risking certain death, um, you know, to, to, you know, liberate Jerusalem from the hands of Islam, right? That, that, that can't possibly have happened. They must have been some other motivation. And in the modern world, right, especially in Western society, we're kind of motivated by capitalistic uh, things and, and money. And so for us, it becomes this notion, oh, well, they must have went for land or for money. Uh, and so then you had this theory, this myth that went around the academic world for a long period of time. I learned it when I was an undergrad that the reason why the Crusades happened was because you had uh, this population explosion in Europe where you had a lot of um, sons. Uh, that part is actually true. There, were, there was an explosion, an increase in population during this period of time. But the myth went, well, you have all these second, third, and fourth born sons and because of the feudal structure of, of especially France. You have all these um, extra sons, so to speak, who, who would not inherit family land, family property, because it all went to the first son, supposedly through primogeniture. So now you have these people who are fighting each other, trying to take land from Christians in Europe. So the church decides to come up with this brilliant idea of, well, let's rally all these second, third, fourth born sons and send them uh, over to the Holy Land to liberate the territory you know, held by Islam. Uh, and that way they can get their land over there, right? And, and, and have peace in Europe. And on the surface, that sounds fantastic, right? That sounds really, um, it makes sense, it's logical. But when you begin to peel the onion back on this, and, and one crusade historian, Jonathan Riley Smith, an English historian, looked at this about 40 years ago or so, and he uncovered that when you look at the medieval manuscripts and you look at, especially in France, the vast majority who went on the first crusade came from France, you look at who went, he found overwhelmingly, it wasn't the second, third, and fourth born sons who went, they, I mean, they did go, but overwhelmingly it was first born sons who were sent and who went. Um, because families recognize how important this was uh, for them and for the church. And so they sent their most important member of the family, the firstborn son, on the crusade. So that kind of blew, blows that myth out of the water. In the academic world, no one believes that myth. I mean, no one will, will, will uh, and with any credibility, who even takes a, a brief moment of time to do some research, uh, you know, in, in crusade history, will, will advocate that. But you still find it in, you know, very popular presentations of the crusades. Well, wasn't it the case that some of these families, they really valued Jerusalem? Weren't they naming their children Jerusalem and things like that? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, in the tenth, Jonathan Riley Smith again found that in his research that in the 1060s, for example, the, the name Jerusalem became a very popular name for uh, French girls, for young, mm -hmm. young young French girls in noble courts and things. So yeah, there was a great devotion among the French at this time for Jerusalem. There were replicas of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher being built in France, all throughout France, you know, based on the the, the uh, blueprint and the architectural plan uh, for the basilica. And so uh, yeah, and the, the worldview of Christians at the time, right, was that Jerusalem is extremely important. Um, it's still obviously important to Christians today, uh, but it was, and it was, you know, under the control of Islam. So therefore it was, it was, uh, you know, occupied territory and there was a great move and desire to liberate that city that, that Blessed Urban II uh, 
uh, fixated on for the goal of that of the first what came to be known as the first crusade. Now, not to go too far down in a rabbit trail, but a lot of people have brought this up previously in the comments section, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, was it the case that the Muslims were the aggressors, and that was really what instigated the Crusades? Yeah, there's a lot of, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into why the Crusades happen and why they happen at, towards the end of the 11th century, if you will. Um, but one of the reasons, for sure, it was the arrival of the Seljuk Turks, right? The Seljuk Turks are a, a Muslim a converted people, not obviously from the Arabian Peninsula, from the Asian steppe, but they come into what was then Anatolia, a province of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire at the time, uh, and they win a great battle in 1071, the Battle of Manzikert, which really kind of pushes uh, upon, it puts a lot of pressure on uh, the Byzantine Empire. And so you have a later emperor, Alexius Komnemnus, who actually sends a request to the West, specifically to the Pope, uh, asking for military aid uh, from the West. So that kind of begins the initial impetus, if you will, uh, and be, you know, the subject aggression uh, in that particular area. And then it leads to Blessed Urban the second kind of expanding uh, the movement or creating a movement a little bit different than what Alexius wanted. Uh, he was looking probably more for mercenary type of troops or troops that would be under his command and a smaller body of troops. Uh, and then when 60,000 warriors show up on his doorstep, you know, in the, in the late 1090s, he's, he's quite taken aback. Doesn't know what to do or how to handle that because that's not what he wanted or expected. But, um, you know, it, it in many ways, right, we start something we don't always necessarily, it can easily get out of out of our control. And that's what happened here with him. But yeah, it's, it, I mean, people at the time, again, we look at things from a contemporary perspective, Christians of Europe at the time understood and believed that what was happening in Jerusalem was, um, you know, their harassment by Christian pilgrims coming from Europe to uh, the, the holy sites in Jerusalem. There were indigenous Christians and Jews being harassed uh, throughout the Holy Land area, even into Egypt. Uh, and you had this request from the from the Eastern Roman Empire. So all of that kind of combined then really leads to what becomes this great crusading movement. Now, one, one more question about the Crusades, then we'll move on to another topic in the book. Um, <clears throat> can you maybe set the record straight for us? Uh, a lot of people are under the impression that John Paul II apologized for the Crusades, but you're somewhat indicating that there really wasn't anything to apologize for or am I misunderstanding? No, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, you know, the word apologize is, is used, I think, um, inappropriately in many different ways, right? So when you, the context of this was as the church was approaching the great jubilee of the year 2000, you know, the Holy Father, um, then John Paul II, uh, initiated a series of reflections. He actually tasked the Interlo International Theological Commission to look at the church's history and to study this topic of, you know, were there events in the past that, that the church needs to reevaluate, if you will. Um, and specifically what they what that commission looked at was a, a whole series of different events in, in history in general. Uh, and they but they didn't pass any judgment necessarily on individual actions. What they did say was they they asked God and the Holy Father did specifically in March of that year 2000 during a great penitential service. He asked God for to forgive the actions of Christians in the past who may not have acted in accordance with their baptismal vocation, right? The holiness mm -hmm. who may not have acted in a virtuous manner did not at all disparage any events in church history specifically. Um, but, you know, recognizing that that Christians of the past, as well as Christians today, right, we're, we're all men and women um, of, you know, a fallen yet redeemed nature. We all sometimes, you know, are, are virtuous and sometimes uh, not so, right, which is the great gift of the sacrament of reconciliation and, and God's grace. And so that's what the whole concept was, was, was about and the context behind it. And then specifically, you know, even leading up to that, he did a address the Fourth Crusade. That's usually where this comes about is the sacking of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade, which was a huge you know, event that really uh, continues even today to kind of muddy the water between the relationship between the Eastern and Western halves of the church. And, uh, you know, he, 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 he recognized, again, that not everyone acted in a virtuous manner in the past, but that's not to say that the crusading movement as a whole was something that was wrong. And that's, that's where I have issues is that you have many people today who say, well, John Paul II said the crusades were bad or were wrong. I uh, even have good Catholics that say that, and that's not true. If you look at the documents, you look at what he said, and you look at what the context was, that's not what he's saying at the time. Um, and that's not what he was, was in, intending to say, and not how we as Catholics should interpret these events either. Now, shifting gears just a little bit, you raised the question in the book, was the filioque an unauthorized addition to the creed? You know, I was reading uh, the other day, 
uh, a book that was talking about the Photian schism. And of course it had letters from John the, uh, John the eighth, uh, to the Photian council. And it seems that he was indicating that there shouldn't have been an addition to the creed, although it, it seems to be that he affirmed the doctrine, but opposed the addition. Can you maybe set the record straight there and also answer the question in the book? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the understanding really, again, the historical context is extremely important to these kinds of things, right? There's a lot of theological considerations um, that go into some of these discussions and issues between the Eastern and Western halves of the church. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to look at the historical context. And, and you know, my understanding of the historical context and why the filioque was added in the West in particular, you know, had to do with the certain... Um, issue that the West was dealing with, and this was the, the conversion of most or many of the ethnically Germanic barbarian tribes after the collapse of the Western Empire in the 5th century, many of those tribes were converted to Aryan to the Aryan heresy. And so there was a movement in Spain in the 6th century in particular to add this, uh, you know, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, the filioque, that part, to the creed in order to kind of distinguish between the Orthodox understanding of faith, um, small o orthodox understanding of the faith, uh, as opposed to the Arian form of, of uh, you know, the faith or the Arian heresy is a more accurate interpretation. So that's why it was added. And then, you know, it wasn't adopted. In, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this too. There wasn't, it wasn't adopted like immediately or uniformity, uniformly throughout the West for a number of centuries, frankly. Uh, and so it becomes a an, an issue later on, as you mentioned, during the time of Photius, where it's it's a way for those certain people in in the eastern part of the church to then criticize the west for for you know and it's it's a theological criticism of other things that are going on if you will so and then it gets muddied and watered and and over the centuries and then it becomes a source of animosity but even today i think that there there's been a lot of movement especially theologically among eastern and western theologians to try to to realize that we you know we both mean the same we both understand the same thing, if you will, in terms of how it's expressed. It's just expressed a little bit differently. Um, but I think we've we've moved past the whole it's heretical, it's not heretical construct, I mm -hmm. think. But I'm not I'm not yeah. well versed in the current theological trends on that. But well, and do you think that maybe the issue with the Bulgars and, you know, a, a, a clashing of the missionaries there between East and West really had to do with the filioque issue here? Um, you know, I'm not so certain if it was it was specific to that issue or if it was a larger issue of of uh, you know control and and over who's you know what what bishop are they going to to follow right Are they going to follow the patriarch in Constantinople? Are they going to look at uh, Rome and and the, the interplay of politics between those two seas as well, right? And it probably had a lot more to do with it, frankly, than than the theology behind things. Yeah, yeah, it it does seem to be the impression that I get, but I'm I'm not an expert, so I'm not saying for sure. It just that's the impression I kind of get. Now, I um I have a lot more questions, but I want to pass it to Eric for a little bit. Uh, let's get your comments and questions as well, Eric. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for coming on again. Um, I think would could you um explain a little bit of why each chapter has two segments. Um, so for the listeners, uh, when you guys get yourself a copy of this fantastic book, you'll notice that in each chapter, there's an up close and personal, and then there's a you be the judge. Mm -hmm. So each part, each chapter has that. What it was that? What, what's the design behind that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Eric, for that question. So it, again, it's it, it goes back to you know the book. We want the book, to, the books in this series to be you know more than just a narrative description, right? We want to have the narrative story, what's happening in the major events, major people during this time. But then we also wanted to have these little sections where you could go and learn uh, about more people in the story of the church during these periods of time that, that we might may not be main characters at least char main characters in terms of when you boil all this down to a uh, you know to a, a 30,000 foot level understanding of what's going on you're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Abbot Suje for example of Saint-Denis in Paris right so and, and your normal narrative 
textbook. You're not going to, a historian's not going to take the time to get into detail about him. You might mention him uh, and associated with the French style of architecture, but you're not going to get into maybe in more detail of his life. So, or somebody like Matilda of Tuscany or these kinds of characters, right? So they play an important role, obviously, in the church's history um, in various, in the, in the time periods in which they live. But again, you're not going to focus on them. So we wanted to take some of uh, the, the book and create certain segments of the book where we would look at these individuals. Um, and it was really, you know, the great thing about it was it was up to the discretion of the author. So I, you know, I was able to kind of go through and 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 think about people that that uh, you know most people wouldn't know an awful lot about, um, but play an important role during this time period and uh, who I could focus on a bit. So that's the, the up close and personal. And then the second section, which is you be the judge, is is again that section where we wanted to take a prevalent myth about the time period and in each in you know in a linear way through the chapters and just explore that myth and refute it quickly. Uh, so that if people don't have a lot of time to pick up each of these volumes are very, you know, um, designed to be brief, designed to be easily read in, in, a, in a short sitting, if you will, uh, and not too detailed or scholarly uh, so that people don't get lost in footnotes and what have you. But um, that's that's the idea behind those those particular uh, sections. And I think they're one of the great features of the series, frankly. Yeah, I, I think that's so I think that was a great idea. And it really, you know, it gives the reader anticipation because the you know the next chapter you'll get the same um one of the chapters though which is interesting is um the one on the papal reform um you know with the paper you know the the Cluny the Cluny reform and St Peter Damien and all that um you know a lot of uh in my in my own dialogue with uh, eastern orthodox for example um they like to gravitate towards the you know there's all kinds of fancy smancy terms they give it the hildebrandian um you know uh, uh disaster or the or you know the Gregorian or, yeah. or revolution and all right. that kind of yeah. thing. And, and sometimes the idea is given that um there were no other motivating factors besides power hungry popes um to try and gain control over the churches in the, throughout Western Europe. And uh, what I think gets missed is the background of this, of all the, your, the local and dispersed secular kings and nobles that were trying to, to sort of, you know, cut the church off from the, the center and, and, and enforce their own control over things. Um, and the popes are having to react to that. Can you speak to that a little bit and maybe uh, what you say in that chapter uh, for us? Yeah, sure. No, Eric, that's a that's a great thing to bring up. That's a, that's actually one of the central uh, themes, if you will, throughout the whole book, right? That I try to highlight is this relationship between church and state, because um, I, I find it first of all, it's it's very much the, one of the main characters of of the time period that that I cover in the book, but also um, it, it's very relevant for relevant for us in our own day and age, right? When we we deal with some of these kinds of you know issues in terms of the church and the state operating together and cooperating or not, and how do we you know deal with these kinds of things, and so uh, it's important important always to have that historical con context. And I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons maybe why the, the uh, you know, story gets a bit muddied, if you will, between East and West when we look at it is, is um, I think it's the perspective, right? So, um, you know, I'm a Latin Rite Catholic, so I'm not a, a, an Easterner, if you will, an Eastern Orthodox, but, or even Eastern Rite Catholic. But um, my impression, my understanding, right, is that uh, you, you have to look at, from an Eastern perspective, it's easy to see, I think, and this is, you know, trying to understand that, that perspective, it's easy to kind of see some of these things that are happening in this time period with, with Gregory the Seventh or with, um, you know, later Leo the Ninth or this, during this reform movement, Blessed Urban II, later on with Innocent III, to see what they're doing in the, ch in the church in their own day and age and dealing with secular rulers is trying to create this, you know, supremacy, um, this hegemony of the uh, you know, hegemonic papacy, right? Because I think one reason for that um, is because of the Eastern perspective of what we term Caesarial papism, right? In terms of how church and state interact. And we miss, I think, frequently on both sides, this understanding that, you know, the church did not operate 
uh, with the state in the same manner in both halves of the church. Uh, if it did, then one could kind of see what's happening in the West as maybe more of a of a accumulation or a power grab by the papacy. But that's not the way it was at all, right? In the West, especially, again, the historical context is important. You go back to the end of the 5th century with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, and you have all these, as you mentioned, these, you know, secular rulers in various regions and areas of Christendom that start to come into power and try to control things in their own little areas, you know, and, and then they come into contact with the bishop, right? So it's the church in the West that modeled the Roman imperial structure where you have bishops in cities and the cities are these old Roman towns, these old Roman centers of administration and government. Uh, the, the, the organizational structure of the church in terms of dioceses is based on the old Western Roman government structure. Structure. And so when that when that power and authority from Rome collapses centrally and it devolves into the local regions, if you will, and local rulers, then there is this kind of tension between church and state that develops in the West, which doesn't really develop so much in the East, or at least it manifests itself differently in the Eastern half of the church. And so as you move forward into history, you have then this, this desire by popes in particular to, um, and it's grow, it grows out of actually an internal church issue in terms of reforming the clergy and reforming the the lives and, and activity of the clergy, right? Because by the time you get to the 10th and 11th century, 11th century in particular, um, you see you know, immorality, sexual immorality rampant throughout the clergy and in monasteries. You see um, all kinds of clerical, what we call ecclesiastical abuses, simony, the buying and selling of ecclesiastical offices. You see a little bit of pluralism where one man is the bishop of multiple dioceses. This becomes a serious problem. And so uh, these popes are trying to reform the clergy uh, and they run into conflict with when doing that internally by external pressure from secular rulers who don't want the certain reforms because they feel it's an, it's encroaching on their ability to control the church in their local regions. Yeah, that's something, you know, they, they, it was a debate on property. It's their property. They pay for the buildings and, um, you know, the, the, the bishops were chosen by them or they were close in association. So a lot of the, a lot of the reforms that uh, came in this, you know, the, the Gregorian reform, but like you said later, it came about with Innocent the, the Third as well, um, is really trying to bring the church to calibrate the church back to its normal function and not to be not to be taken hostage by, um, you know, the, the kings and the nobles and and they're members of the church, but they're not they're not in control of the church. So it's it's very important to uh, keep in mind that some of these popes were reacting and not innovating. Because that's the idea that uh, gets out a lot is that the, the popes were the, these popes rose to the zenith of papal power because of greed and all this this kind of thing. But it, it really had spirituality behind it. It, it really had um, a, you know the a Christian intention in other words. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And that's that's what I try to point out in that particular chapter you mentioned, the papal reform chapter, is that the, one of the ways in which this movement begins is when you have these these um, uh, men who become pope who actually before their pope are monks right so they and then particularly they're from Cluny from the monastery of Cluny so as part of that Cluniac reform they you know rapidly if you will progress through the the church and come to the position of power and authority in the papacy and they they want to utilize the understanding of the papacy in the west and understand the the power and authority they have in that office to initiate this re this internal reform uh, and it, it is like you said it's motivated out of a sense of 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 Christian virtue, right? It's motivated out of a sense of, hey, that, you know, we need, we as a clergy need to be living uh, what we profess, right? We believe and we're not in many ways. And so let's, let's reform that. And in the process of that, it impacts, right? The secular rulers and their control and their candidates they want for various Episcopal offices. And then the popes respond to that. So yeah, it's not so much an innovation as it is an internal, it starts internally and then it has to deal with external issues as well. Yeah, I think, and I think that's really important that, like, you have the medieval man in, in the medieval time ch chapter, uh, chapter one, because it's really sometimes we impose our perspective into the past, and 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 as a result, it colors our interpretation of the past. So when we move to Leo the Ninth, for example, and and some of his mandates, we could call it, or um, I I don't really remember who wrote the famous letter that. Cardinal Humbert, I think it was he that wrote it, but um, he, he wrote something when they went to Constantinople 
And this is kind of what st stirred the pot there in 1054. Um, it almost appears as though Cardinal Humbert and the three or four uh, legates that were with him kind of expected the East to submit to the West, just like the West submits to Rome. You know, and they kind of they kind of were surprised a little bit of, uh, of a number of things. I mean, there the, you know, I know that Cardinal Humbert um, found it in himself to compliment a few things that he saw in Constantinople, but he he's surprised that they don't have the filioque and the creed. He's surprised that um, their 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 priests are married and and a number of these things. Um, what do you think caused this? Not just the phenomena itself, but it's almost like he was expecting there to be so much congruity between the East and the West. Yeah, I think there was, I mean, there was a, a bit of that. I mean, I think, uh, I also think, though, that, I mean, it's a both and, right? I think he knew, though, that there was significant differences, right? Because, I mean, he, you know, Humbert in particular, he he knew Greek, which was a rarity in in the West at the time, um, because there really wasn't that that level of interaction as there had been in previous centuries, especially in the church. Um, you know, he knew, obviously, that there was a huge theological issue with leavened versus unleavened bread in the Eucharist, um, you know, which which he engaged in pen wars with people, you know, with monks there in the East when he was in Constantinople over that whole issue. Um, but again, we have to understand who Humbert really was. And he was a man who was, you know, dedicated to the ecclesial reform that was going on in the West. I mean, he, he wrote a very famous treatise on, uh, against, you know, simony, against simonax, uh, those who buy and sell church offices. And so, you know, he takes all of that, you know, with him when he goes to the East. And I think perhaps, um, you know, without, um, you know, not being him or not knowing him personally, hard to get into his his brain. But in a certain sense, maybe we could surmise that that he hoped or thought that by going to the to the east in that um, in that mission by Leo the Ninth, that that he it was another situation of reform, right? Where where you have this this. Um, maybe he believed that the patriarch or others in the East were too controlled by the secular rulers, by the emperor, and that it was an opportunity for him to try to impose some of the internal ecclesial revolution that was, or, or uh, reform rather, that was going on in the West, uh, in the East too. Uh, and so, you know, that, I'm sure that cl colored a bit his his approach to that mission and his relationship with others. Plus, we know that he had a very famous temper, that he was not a man who was, who was who, you know, we would say today he had an anger management problem, right? He was not somebody who um, <laughs> was a very peaceful or tranquil guy. Um, not usually somebody you send as a diplomat in a tense situation. You know, you <laughs> want somebody cool and calm and collected who will listen to both sides. Yeah, he was not known for being that at all. So that also didn't help uh the situation and 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 the patriarch uh michael carolarius wasn't such an agreeable person either <laughs> exactly yeah that's true you have two irascible yeah, right. individuals getting together and it's it's a bad scene yeah 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 excellent excellent um i guess my last question before we toss it back to uh michael is a lot of people here investiture controversy very little people understand exactly what that was can you give just a brief description of what that was and how uh, popes came to regulate that. Yeah, sure. Investiture concert. The, the investiture of of clerics is a, is a difficult um, you know concept for many people to understand because we don't live in a a time of of the feudal system, right? Or of or of an understanding between the relationship of a lord and a subject, or a vassal and a lord, however you want to describe it. And um, and there's there's huge debate in the academic community about feudalism and feudal structures and feudal systems and this and that. But but in essence, the way that this plays out, it's really kind of focused on imperial German territory, um, and it has to do with in, in these territories, these German areas, you had the king of the Germans who utilized bishops as a way to regulate or to extend his power and authority throughout the territory. Because um, as we know, Germany is not a United Kingdom. There's It's a very small kingdom at this time. There's, you know, the Holy Roman Emperor is someone who is has to be nominated and consecrated by the Pope. It's not a hereditary thing. There's a lot of political issues involved here. So the king of the Germans found that bishops, right, are, are ones who can help him regulate his territory well and extend 
tremendous power and authority. So the practice grew up in these in these German territories, where the king would uh, appoint uh, the cleric, a bishop right to his diocese or even an abbot uh and then in a ceremony and it which was very akin to the feudal ceremony of of uh, bringing the relationship between lord and subject the king would then hand the, the episcopal or the ecclesial symbols of the episcopal office the ring and the crozier to the bishop uh, along with his then uh, you know lay symbols or secular symbols of office as well the sword or spirit what have you this was all kind of done together initially they were separated then they came to, became uh part of a combined ceremony and so that caused some confusion and some um you know in the eyes of people you know who really is appointing the bishop here where is he getting his secular or his spiritual authority is it coming from the secular realm is it coming from the spiritual realm you know how to where does this come from and there's there was some you know issues with with the gray area in terms of, of how that was perceived and so when you get to the reform again this internal church reform movement um you know is is something that gregory the saint gregory the seventh in particular looks at and he sees that this is a is a problem in that it, it prevents the church from being able to regulate itself and to reform itself if the pope cannot uh you know appoint bishops if there is a bishop who is also beholden to a secular lord uh, not only for his secular properties but even for his episcopal office now that poses a conflict of interest and so in order to separate that and to focus on the internal reform gregory says we're not going to do that anymore under pain of excommunication and the king of the germans at the time henry the fourth says you know well i don't like that you're imposing on my ability to regulate and rule my my power or you know my authority in, in my kingdom uh and so you're a false pope right you're not you're not a false monk you're not even really a pope and so then he begins to agitate and the whole controversy goes back and forth between the two men and eventually ends up in uh and gregory having to call the Normans in to help him after, you know, Henry's army takes over the city of Rome, then he has to flee and he dies in exile. Um, and eventually the whole thing is settled in a, in a compromise later on in the 12th century uh, with, you know, Episcopal symbols of office are given by a cleric to a bishop. Secular symbols are given by the secular Lord. And so that, that division of labor, if you will, or division of authority is more clearly defined. But the whole issue really is is church and state, which is, um, you know, who controls the church and is the church independent or is she controlled by the state? Um, how does the church want to see that or view that? And and rightly so, I think the popes in the West, beginning with Gregory, said there has to be separation. There has to be distinction in power and authority um, so that both of these institutions, if you will, can can work together for the greater glory of God and for uh, the benefit of the, of the common people. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's just very, very important to drive home. And I, I, I appreciate how church and state, it comes up throughout your book, because, you know, this is something we, it's already anticipated with the Constantinian revolution and it, and it comes up over and over again. It's almost like it never gets resolved, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, just recently I saw, it wasn't recent, it was a while ago, uh, an Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christian give a lecture and he was going over the Henry versus Gregory fiasco, and he was basically trying to argue that Gregory the Seventh was the first schismatic Latin pope um, because he was just power hungry. But I think you know your point here is just absolutely uh, missing, and 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 it needs to get out. And I appreciate you get it out in this book that the church is really on the verge of becoming victim to the state. And in order to overcome that, there has to be um, the, 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 the divinely sanctioned authority of the church has to come out. So I, I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm actually going to pass it to Michael now. Um, I really appreciate your answers. Great. Thanks, Eric. You know, earlier you brought up the issue of the Babylonian captivity of the church. Uh, can you maybe briefly address that? Tell us what exactly it was, the Avignon papacy, stuff like that. Yeah. So what happens is, is in the, when you get to the 14th century, right, there's, there's a series of, or even when you get to the beginning of the 14th century in particular, right, there's, by this point, you have some issues in the College of Cardinals uh, where they've really divided into kind of nationalistic groups where you have French cardinals and Italian cardinals. And many times they can't even, this, this is towards the end of the 13th century, actually, you, they can't decide on who should be Pope. And there's, there's even periods of long interregnums, right, where there's years go by where there's not even uh, a, a Pope. So because of the, the 
groups can't decide. So eventually there's an issue with, you know, one early 14th century pope, the first pope of the 14th century, Boniface VIII. Um, again, with this, you know, going back to a lot of Eric's questions, you know, this, this interplay and relationship between church and state that continues to, to evolve through these centuries. And so you have Philip IV, the king of France, and Boniface VIII, and they go back and forth on this issue of, of taxation, right, of the church, uh, where Philip takes the taxes that are from the church that are supposed to be their church land, church property, they're supposed to go, part of it goes down to Rome. He keeps those ta taxes, he takes tax from the, the church and uses it for his own secular means, right? He uses it to wage war and for his own political purposes. Uh, and Boniface has issues with that, rightly so. Again, another issue of, you know, you're, you're over the state overreaching its authority and power into the realm of the church. And he says, you can't do that. And again, this very akin to what happened between Henry and um, Gregory centuries before, you have this, this uh, huge controversy and crisis between a, a pope and a king. Uh, and this ultimately ends, again, with Boniface dying after being roughed up by, by some uh, henchmen, you know, by uh, Philip IV has his chief advisor named William of Nogare. Uh, he grabs this mercenary band of group, a group together. They go down to Italy. They actually capture Boniface uh, in his hometown, keep him under lock and key for a, a day or so before the townspeople come and rescue him. Uh, and then he dies about a month later from, from being roughed up in this whole event. And when Boniface dies, right, Philip IV is obviously very keen to not have to deal with a pope who's pushing back on his designs on the church. He wants to deal with somebody who's more pliable, somebody who is more amenable to his way of, of exercising control over the church in France and his territory. So eventually the cardinals uh, do elect a, a successor to um, Boniface, who is Clement V. And Clement V decides that he's a Frenchman, uh, he's the Archbishop of Bordeaux, uh, Bertrand de Gott, and he decides, you know what, I don't, I don't like Rome. Rome is hot, humid in the summer. It's nasty. It's, it's not very nice. And, and so I'm somewhat joking, but he, you know, he, he's living in France, doesn't make his way to Rome, but he decides, you know, why, why do we have to live in, in, in Rome? We can live wherever we want. So he decides to move the papal residency to the south of France, to the town of Avignon which technically was papal territory at the time. So this is not territory controlled by the King of France, but it's near territory, obviously controlled by the King of France. Uh, and so he decides to live there. There are other reasons for why it was a, a, you know, not a bad move necessarily for the Bishop of Rome to live in Avignon. There's some other political considerations. The Hundred Years' War is going on during this time between England and France. It's a little bit easier for them to try to negotiate um, some peace between these two kings, these powerful monarchs of Christendom, if they're closer. It's a little more centrally located, some of those events, than Rome is. But regardless, they, he moves the, the residence there. It was intended to be somewhat of a temporary move. Besides um, that reason, there was the other reason of in Rome, you have a lot of infighting between uh, Italian families surrounding the Rome and in Rome itself it was a very unstable political situation for the popes to be living in Rome as well. So again, a lot of different reasons for the move, um, but he moves, he moves the residence. Meant it to be temporary. The first few popes after him mean uh, it to be temporary and try to move back to Rome as well. But eventually, you know, inertia sets in and it becomes untenable to move back to Rome and the popes decide to live in Avignon. And they stay there in the south of France for the, for about 70 years. Um, and so here you have the Bishop of Rome engaged in an ecclesiastical abuse of absenteeism, right? He's still the Bishop of Rome. He's still the Pope of, of the church. He's just not living in Rome. He's living in Avignon. Um, I always like it, liken it when I talk about this in parishes and things to you know, Pope Francis deciding tomorrow to to move his residence to you know Buenos Aires or whatever. He just wants to go back to Argentina, Argentina rather to be closer to family friends. He likes the the climate better than Rome, um, what have you. Uh, that would be a, it's a scandal, right? That would cause all kinds of issues and problems, especially in our modern day and age with all the social media and whatnot. Could you imagine the 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 uh, freak out on Catholic Twitter over something like that? But um, you know it would be uh, at a huge scandal scandalous event. So obviously it was so it was scandalous too uh, in in the 14th century. And, and it causes significant problems because you end up having a situation where many of the secular rulers of Europe think that the Pope is a nothing more than the puppet of the French king. Now the popes who lived in Avignon were were far from that, frankly. They really were. They they weren't just there to do, you know, at the beck and call of the French king. They were their own independent rulers and they still managed and governed the church as independently as they could. 
but the perception was such that they were the French, you know, puppet of the French king. And that poses significant problems for the papacy, frankly. It's a loss of respect for the Pope. Uh, you know, it, it causes a lot of resentment throughout other areas of Christendom. And that resentment builds and builds and builds uh, until we get to the 16th century and then it erupts into, you know, the Protestant revolution. So that's one of the factors I think that, that leads to that, this crisis in the 14th century papacy. Now, let me shift gears a little bit. You bring up the issue in the book of Saint uh, Saint Francis and whether or not he was a, you know, <laughs> a big time animal lover, animal rights kind of guy. What 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 exactly was his position here? If you can maybe set the record straight. Yeah, I wanted to. Yeah, thanks for that. I wanted to to you know, in one of those sections of up close and personal. You know, was was Francis just this kind of you know hippie flower child, if you will, that that he's right. so often portrayed in in many places and <laughs> and. Uh, um, you know, there, there's there's a, a desire on on my part, frankly, to try to restore right the image of some of these events of Catholic past and in persons of Catholic past in a, in a more authentically Catholic way, right? Because I think that it, in understanding them from the the contemporary times in which they live, from their times rather, um, instead of you know our times. I mean, I think Eric was the one that mentioned this is that you know we 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 have this modernity has this uh, this complex of reading backwards into history, right? We, we, we feel we're so superior than, than those who've come before us that we look back on them and we take what, what is our worldview and our geopolitical situation and, and our so-called intellectual and scientific achievements and we, we paste it backwards and say, oh, look how ignorant or superstitious these people were. Or, um, you know, obviously because Francis preached to the gospel to God's creatures, um, you know, to the, to a wolf or to birds, he obviously, you know, was one in, in, in touch with the environment. He was one who, you know, was tolerant of everyone. He was, he embodied all these great, you know, cultural, um, uh, you, you know, uh, events of the sixties and all these other things that, that we, we like to, uh, you know, pride ourselves on being in the modern world. But if you look at Francis himself and you look at, again, who he was in the context of the times in which he lived, right? Francis, yes, understood, um, that the gospel needed to be spread throughout the world. Yes. He preached to birds, at least, you know, we understand we have stories or, you know, and the wolf, um, that he did that from a contemporary perspective, but he didn't do it because, you know, out of a sense of, um, uh, you know, some misguided animal love, if you will, right? It was it was motivated out of a desire to appreciate and understand God's creation, right? So the 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 impetus was always God, right? The impetus was was Christ, was the gospel. It wasn't it was the creator, not the creature, if you will, right? And I think we get that backwards sometimes when we we always you know picture Francis with with in the statuary in the garden with the birds and this and that that he's some kind of you know uh, animal lover flower child kind of person and he wasn't that right his one of the biggest goals and I point this out in the book of the, his order in the beginning was evangelization of Muslims right that was the prime one of the prime focus um, of his of his of his order uh, and you know he sent friars into Muslim territory to evangelize. He himself went on the fifth crusade to the crusader camp in Damietta in Egypt, uh, crossed the, the, you know, the, the com combatant lines there to get to the Sultan Al Kamil to, to preach the gospel to him and to try to evangelize him. So he, it wasn't out of a misguided sense of, of, uh, you know, modern understanding of these things. It was, it was, he was a man deeply rooted in the gospel, deeply rooted in love for Christ. And that, permeated and pervaded everything that he did and i think we lose that sometimes but now there was another issue that you brought up here and you know it, it's involving something that we hear a lot and i've had a lot of people ask for us to address this in shows so um i'm, I'm glad it's addressed in the book um you you raise the question of whether or not the church blamed the jews for the black death can you maybe comment on that yeah, sure. So that's, you know, we talked about the Avignon papacy here a little bit ago. And so when the popes are, re are in Avignon, that's when middle of the 14th century, you have this horrific plague, this pestilence, this great mortality, they called it. Uh, later on is given the moniker, the Black Death. And, uh, it, you know, it decimated the population of Europe. And, you know, the people reacted to that um, in, in many different ways. You know, it's, it's uh, very different from what we're experiencing now uh, with the whole COVID stuff. But there's 
elements in our modern world that, that perhaps give us a better appreciation for what was going on at that period of time. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, being upset at the situation, being fearful of the situation, being fearful of, of our health and, and our mortality, uh, and then finding ways to blame others, right, for why this happened. Um, you know, uh, you see that happen in the modern day with, with COVID, right? The same thing happened with the Black Death. Christians began to, to ask the questions and think to themselves, well, why is this happening? Uh, and they, they place blame in different areas, right? Some people thought that it was, you know, God um, sending the plague as, as a judgment, right, on people for the sins of, of uh, the world, if you will, or the sins of, of people at the time. Um, others, you know, so there this whole movement grew up as a result of that thought, actually, called the flagellants, where they went around, there were, you know, penitent group that went and um, practiced public penance, public flogging, and public whipping of themselves in order to, uh, you know, alleviate the uh, the anger of God, if you will, in a penitential way. So there is that response. And then other response, especially what we see in, sadly, in, in areas along the Rhineland in particular, in, in what is now modern-day Germany, you had people, and even in, in other in parts of France and places where you had large uh, concentrations of Jewish population, you had people blame the Jews, thinking that the Jews were responsible, that somehow they had, had uh, poisoned the wells that people were drinking, and that's how the Black Death came about. You know, again, we're living in it, or you're talking about a time where people didn't understand um, how diseases spread or immunology or any of these other kinds of things that we know of today. So, um, you know, the Jews became scapegoats in certain areas of Christendom. Uh, and when word of that got back to the church and especially to the popes in Avignon, um, you know, they were quick to condemn that very quick to condemn it. You know, uh, the one Pope who wrote about this in, in Avignon during the time said, you know, uh, he looked at it from a, from a very sensical pos um, position, right? That the people, the Jewish people are dying from the Black Death too, um, just like the Christians. So why would they, why would they start something or, or begin some kind of disease that would impact them and kill them as well? That makes no sense. Um, and, and actually under pain of excommunication said no one should harass, you know, Jewish people. Um, by uh, by blaming them for the plague, uh, you know. Now th there was some in some areas where right, the Jews seem to not be as affected or impacted by the Black Death as as others, as Christians in certain areas in certain towns. But there's a whole lot of factors and reasons for that. Um, they tended to live, you know, isolated from uh, other groups, right? From the Gentiles, they didn't live near wharfs and other areas where uh, the plague seemed to come and, and spread. Uh, they also, you know, practice a little bit different hygiene techniques and whatnot. Uh, and their diets also were different. So there's a lot of different reasons for, for why that, that may have happened or why they may have been impacted less, um, but they were still impacted. And the church responded in a way that, that made sure to condemn that action as the church had in the past, right? There were pogroms that erupted um, after the calling of the first crusade, again, through the Rhineland of, of what is now modern day Germany and, and popes and bishops at the time, uh, and even preachers, great saints like St. Bernard of Clairvaux later in the second crusade condemned those actions and activities uh, as well. Excellent. And, and that answers my other question, because I was pretty much going to go there. I mean, ha has it been the case, um, you know, outside of this event that the church has been uh, hostile to the Jews or has there and, you know, maybe a different approach. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, you know, there, there is obviously, it's a very um, complex relationship and story, right, between the Jewish people and Christian people in, Medi in Europe, uh, especially medieval Europe. And, and it's, it gets very, um, you know, it, a lot of people in the modern world like to take those situations and, and again, apply a more modern perspective to it and not understand why there would have been this distinction or this difference or this conflict between these groups of people. Um, we, we very, and it's another uh, um, way in which I bring it up in the book and when we talk about the medieval, when I write about the medieval inquisitors as well, is that people have a misunderstanding, or people in the modern age, especially in our country, the United States, the Western world, we, we grew up in an age of religious pluralism, right? We grew up up in an age where um, you know you can believe what you want to believe, I believe what I want to believe, whatever. That simply did not exist in the medieval world. Medieval that is a foreign concept to medieval people. They did not understand that whatsoever. They recognized that there was a distinction between Jews and Muslims. If you were in Spain in particular, in other areas, they may have had contact with Muslims uh, and Christians, but. Uh, you know, there was a distinct difference between the groups. You understood those distinct differences. Uh, and sometimes there was an interplay or, or conflict between those groups. But uh, there was never a sense, right, from medieval uh, people that, um, you know, there, there is, is no difference in religion, right? That and you can believe whatever you want to believe and, and you're still fine and okay. That's, that was not 
what they understood or how they lived their lives um, because the faith was so important to who they were, their social identity, uh, you know, their even their later on their national identity, uh, their universal identity as Christians uh, motivated and pervaded everything, uh, which mm. we just don't have in our modern age. And so it's difficult for us to understand those, those interplays and those complex relationships. Now, um, before we get to some of the chat questions, Eric, did you have any other final uh, questions or comments there? Uh, no, um, I just get the book. I mean, uh, perfect. I mean, his, he's got more books also. And also, uh, the Epic series, um, he did the Epic series, which if you want a general course through history, maybe you could briefly say that because I think a lot of our listeners, um, are really interested in getting the, uh, uh you know, like a bird's eye view of history. Um, maybe you could talk just a second about what that is and how they can get that. Yeah, sure. So uh, years ago, uh, through Ascension Press, I did this program called Epic, A Journey Through Church History, uh, which is a, you know, it's a, a adult faith formation program where I take the 2000 years of church history and divide them into 12 different time periods that are color coded, which is a, just a memory device to help you remember what's mm -hmm. the main theme of what's going on in each of these 12 time periods. Um, and it's all right now, Ascension has taken that. I did it originally. It was, you know, uh, back in old technology with DVDs and CDs and things like that. So um, it tells you how long or how old I am. <laughs> Now, but um, but Ascension has has updated that, and they've digitized all those and put them onto their uh, streaming platform. So if you go into Am or to uh, I'm sorry Ascension Press's website, you can find ways and how to enroll in that class and take that from you know uh, from your the home from your home. Um, and then I I, I can't announce that uh, I'm also in works where I have uh, uh, I'm going to in, enter into a project with uh, Catholic Answers mm -hmm. to also through their School of Apologetics to pr to provide an introductory course on church history which um, hope to do hope to tape that sometime this year so that might not be available till next year but that's in the works as well for people but definitely now go to ascension press and, and check that program out uh, i'm gonna have to check that out because i always wanted to see the series i remember when i was becoming catholic in 2012 and i, I don't know if that's when it was coming out but at least it was new for me seeing it then and i was thinking man i gotta watch that so <laughs> i'm well, gonna you, go check it out you had the more detailed version michael in the, in the court in the course that's true <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> but that, that's how I, I knew you even before I took your courses because I had seen you there. And I'd also listened to a lot of your material on uh, Catholic Answers because, I mean, you, you've done a lot of um, radio interviews with them, a lot of good and helpful stuff on there, too. So y'all y'all definitely check that out. Um, now, there's a question here from Mike. Uh, how can Catholics and even Orthodox fight the secular historiography? Uh, what are your comments there? Yeah, great question from Mike there. It's um, I get that question a lot, actually, in terms of, of how do we, you know, it's usually framed from the perspective of, well, how do I know what good books to read? You know, how do I know who's an authentic historian, who's not, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the best way is, I think, to, that I've, um, that I try to give people advice on this is what I've mentioned as a theme throughout our talk tonight is, you know, approaching history and viewing history from that, the perspective of those who lived during it, right? An authentic historian, whether they're a Christian or not, um, is going to approach the subject matter from that perspective, right? If you start reading books from historians and they are they're uh, you know very anti-Christian or they're anti-Muslim or they're anti-whatever, and they're they're very much from a, a modern perspective, and you you see the secular humanism pervasive through their work, uh, which should be fairly obvious if you're a faith-believing Christian, right? You'll you'll be able to spot that. Uh, then put that book down. That's not an authentic historian, right? Um, you want to find historians who write about people from their perspective. And and frankly, there are a lot of good historians um, that you know aren't Christian. Or you know, some are Jews, um, some are Muslims, some are not even you know any faith whatsoever. Uh, but they write from an authentic perspective, and they try to truly understand. Uh, you know, the perspective of people living in the subjects in which they cover. They don't always get it right. Um, you know, I can't tell you how often I read different history books and um, just start screaming and throwing things when I hear people <laughs> write about the, <laughs> when I when I read about people talking about indulgences, you know, historians yeah. who just have no idea theologically what an right. indulgence is and they just spew forth all kinds of horrible things uh, and wrong and erroneous things. And it just makes me really upset. But, uh, but, but, but there are those though, frankly, who take the time 
they're not Catholic, they're not Christian, but they do take the time to read good and authentic Christian Catholic sources to understand what an indulgence is, as an example. Uh, and they, they then write that in, the, in their works. So um, you don't always have to find somebody who is Catholic, is my point. Um, you have to find somebody who, who, wants to, who does approach the material from an authentic perspective, and that's the perspective of those who live during the times. Do you want to pull your hair out when you read Runciman? <laughs> Yeah, I do. You know, I mean, Ryan Brentzman, um, yeah, he's 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 so still popular, which is crazy. You you, you type into Amazon, right? Uh, Crusades and his books will still come up. That three volume right, history yeah, he wrote yeah. in 1950 is still still sells well, and because it's easy to read, frankly, and it's it's engaging yeah. the way he wrote it. Um, but he's been thoroughly debunked debunked by all major crusade historians today. Nobody uses it's, him for that. You know, it's interesting though. A lot of um, and, and I don't think this happens in academia. I wouldn't know one way or the other. But on, on the online blogosphere, uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, take advantage of using Runciman quite a bit. Yeah. And and some people find that surprising because he wasn't Orthodox. He's an English. Uh, I think he was part of the Church of England. But he seemed to really take the Byzantine side on things. Yeah, well, that was his specialty, right? He was a, he was a historian of the Eastern Roman Empire of the Byzantine yeah. Empire, so he he understands that perspective. And but but yeah, but takes the side of that perspective. And you know, when when he's calling the Westerners barbarians and referring to the Crusades as the greatest sin against the Holy Spirit ever, um, and the Fourth Crusade, one of the major major crimes of humanity, and he's writing in 1950, right after the Holocaust and the Second mm -hmm. World War, and the Fourth Crusade is is one of the greatest, you know, or even in his mind, the greatest single human crime uh it's, wow. it's astounding to me that he could he could write that um but wow. he's not around he's not around sadly anymore for us to debate him on it but right. um, other side of the veil yeah <laughs> uh this one is somewhat related question as the the previous one what is your historical hermeneutic so my historical hermeneutic it's i mean it, it's a you know my perspective right is is focusing on again history from an authentic perspective i keep eating that that horse but hopefully it gets across right is is trying to under, i mean i'm a catholic uh you know i'm a, de I'm a devout catholic I, I live my faith and try to practice my faith as much as possible obviously and and uh that comes across in my writing so uh but i'm up front with that perspective but that doesn't mean that i whitewash you know history either um or anything about the church I try to present things uh, fairly and and, uh, and again from that contemporary perspective perspective um but you know it is a perspective and a hermit that's focused on on um, you know revitalizing um true and authentic catholic history frankly mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. not watering it down not apologizing in an inappropriate way for those things mm -hmm. trying to explain the the negative and improper actions of people in the church's past from the perspective of which they lived um not justifying it but explaining it so uh, so that we can have a better appreciation for it in our on our own day and age uh, Hugh, one of our faithful uh, viewers and listeners, asks, what type of economies existed throughout the Middle Ages, and what is the closest modern equivalent system? I think he's probably asking this because we had that uh, uh, Catholic economics roundtable with uh, Trent Horn the other day, so I think he's in <laughs> economics mode. Yeah, what, what do you think here? Um, well, I can answer some of this question. I think I'm not I'm not an, an economist and, and don't pretend to be one or play one on TV. So I really can't uh, answer that that to to uh, the last part of that question. But in the, in the you know medieval period, obviously this is a period of time where agriculture is king, uh, where the economy is rooted in the land uh, and in who controls the land and how much land they control. Um, but as as I point out in one of the sections of the book, right about serfs, there's there's a lot of um, myths and misunderstandings about about uh, serfs and slavery, right? That some yeah. people view serfs and, and they're, they're portrayed very frequently in, in Hollywood and in films mm -hmm. and things is, is almost slave-like, mm -hmm. um, but that's not true, right? Serfs had their own plot of land that they could work. Um, the real distinction in the Middle Ages uh, between agricultural workers really and peasants was whether they were free or unfree. And the, only, the distinction there was what, what relationship you had to others. So an unfree peasant uh, was someone who owed rents and fees and services to someone else, uh, either to a free peasant, free, free peasant, or to a lord, um, and that meant that you had to work two thirds of your time on that person's land, right, and a third of your time on your land. A free peasant was free; he could work his land 100% of the time. Um, that's the real distinction. But the agricultural or the economic system was rooted in land, rooted in the crops of the land, you know, in livestock, and also trades, you know, certain trades. Um, you know, uh, goods and services, bakers, fullers, weavers, you know, tanners, uh, blacksmith, those kinds of things. But a very, um, 
complex and interrelated economic structure that's for sure during the middle ages but uh and one that was that was also um you know also impacted by trade uh and uh you know long distance trade as well as regional trade and this is the period of time i write in my book when you have uh, great fairs you know carnivals and marketplaces where merchants from all over a region would gather uh you know uh, on an annual basis or even in more than more frequently than that uh to sell their wares and so there was a good and free exchange of goods and services uh you know throughout the medieval period Ryan Pope asks the question, how would the professor respond to the claims that the papacy in the Middle Ages goes well beyond what was implicitly present in the early church? Uh, well, well, Ryan has a great last name, first of all. Um, yeah. Pope, so that's, <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, the, it, you know, again, here's uh, this is a question that gets asked an awful lot, right, about the history of the papacy and the development of papal primacy and, and his universal jurisdiction and what have you. Um, I, the best way that I try to describe it is this, is that papal primacy, I know this is not a show on that, um, but papal primacy was something that was acknowledged in the early church, but the growth and development of it differed and and it grew and developed i should say over time and over the centuries right and and it's it is also exercised in different ways in different periods of church history right depending upon uh many factors the geopolitical factor in which the pope is living and working um you know the relationship what's going on in the, in the eastern half of the church as well that always plays a role and impact and a factor in it as well so um I, I would argue that again, you know, it's there's no real accretion or 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 uh, change uh, in terms of of the basic understanding and basic underlying premise of papal primacy, supremacy, and jurisdiction. Um, but it's exercised right differently, mm. and it changes um, again because of the external fa and internal factors at play. Mm. Uh, Parker asks, uh, "Is the sack of Constantinople as bad as they say it was?" Uh, maybe a rebuttal to this. Yeah, well, the I mean, any sack is is never a good thing necessarily in terms of the people who are experiencing the sack. We could say that, right? So, um, but in terms of you know, I, I think again, the Fourth Crusade is and the sack of Constantinople during it is one of those things that gets blown a lot, you know, gets blown out of proportion an awful lot, right, uh, mm -hmm. on both sides of the of the discussion. Um, but at the end of the day. It, you know, my perspective on it is the the Crusaders, you know, did did things they shouldn't have done. Pope Innocent the Third continued to tell them not to go to Constantinople, to go to Jerusalem, to fulfill their crusade vow. Uh, he started way before they even got there. You know, when they decided they wanted to go to Zara um, on the Adriatic because the Venetians, Enrico Dandolo, asked them to do it because they didn't have enough money to pay him because the treaty they entered into was horrible and their terms were, were wrong. Um, all of this I, I cover in the book. But, um, uh, you know, they uh, they ultimately went to Constantinople at the invitation of a Byzantine prince. They went there because Alexius Angelus asked them to go, uh, convinced them that he could provide them with all the things that they wanted, mon money, men, to be able to pursue the crusade. And the only reason why they were there and the sack happened was because he, they got invited. Um, now, they also went and they took up on that invitation. So it's it's a both-and situation of blame. Uh, but that, that little but yet significant detail usually is left out of any conversation uh, when we talk about the fourth crusade and, and the con sack of Constantinople. Uh, less one here. Uh, what was the church teaching on usury in the middle ages? And was there any group in medieval society who practiced it? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, usury has a, a again, as a complex, um, you know, uh, history in, in the church and in her teachings, um, and, you know, usury, you know, excessive interest on loans, uh, you know, the, it impact, the church's teaching on it and, and how the church developed that and implemented it um, impacted different regions of Christendom in different ways, um, you know, and, and so at times that posed issues with uh, merchant activity and business activity, um, you know, Jews in particular were, were not subject, obviously, to church law. Uh, and so they tended to, in certain areas of, of Christendom, tended to those, um, you know, businesses that focused on lending money and, and, and whatnot. But it wasn't just Jews. There were others right later on. You have very important banking families in, in, in areas of Christendom that are Christian uh, that violate the church's teachings in this area as well to gain power and wealth and whatnot. So um, it's, a, it's a complex discussion, frankly, and, and it's, it's one of those you know, economic questions, again, that, that uh, people are, are fascinated by. But um, mm. it's, uh, it's something that I don't necessarily focus on myself, frankly, and uh, I feel it's one of those, those 
doctrines and, and, and teachings that, that's applicable in a certain area in a certain per period of time. And then it just, the, the understanding of it gets changed and blown out of proportion later on. But, mm. Now the book is, you should be able to see it on your screen there. And uh, let me actually remove uh, that so y'all can see it a little bit better. The Church in the Middle Ages, Catholicism, or I'm sorry, uh, Cathedrals, Crusades, and the Papacy in Exile by Professor Steve Weidenkampf. Um, Professor, let me ask you this. And by the way, I put a link in the chat. If I'm sorry, not the chat, but the description if y'all want to uh, get it from Ave Maria Press or Amazon.com. There's links there. But let me also uh, ask you this. Is there anything else that you're working on that we could look forward to in addition uh, to this? Yeah, so actually, I'm I'm finishing up a manuscript now for Catholic Answers, um, mm -hmm. on uh, it's it's a somewhat of a unique book, frankly. It's uh, mm -hmm. I look at um, uh, cr different crises in church history, some of which we talked about today, the investiture controversy and the and the uh, the you know the Gregory reform or Gregorian reform, if you will, and the problem with the clerical immorality and whatnot. But I look at various different church crises, and uh, what I do is I give a historical background to what happened, what the crisis was, but then I show how each crisis in church history produced a great reform and great mm -hmm. renewal in the church. And so it's it's kind of a, uh, it's my own personal commentary, if you will, on our own day and age, uh, mm -hmm. where I see just a lot of people disagreeing and, and getting angry with each other in the Catholic world about things that are happening in the church today. And, um, you know, with this pontificate or the world as a whole or different political things that are coming in. And I'm trying, my hope is that people will take this book and, uh, and kind of have a longer approach, right? A longer view, mm -hmm. a historian's mm -hmm. Uh, view of our current context, uh, not to diminish it, um, but rather to place it in the current in the proper context and understand it, uh, and then have a better perspective. Right? That we need to really just root ourselves in Christ. We need to root ourselves in in His grace and the sacraments of the Church. Uh, call out, you know, uh, immorality and problems and corruption where they exist, but to do so in an authentic and obedient way. And so I end the book with a chapter, one I'm actually writing now, on uh, on how to and how not to respond to a crisis mm -hmm. in the church. And it's a case study where I look at the, live and, the lives and actions of St. Catherine of Siena uh, mm -hmm. versus uh, Savonarola, a 15th century Florentine okay. Dominican um, who ended up being burned at the stake, uh, and, and say, you know, let's be more like St. Catherine and not like Savonarola. No, nobody wants to be burnt at the stake, so don't do that. That's awesome. Now, um, do, do you know when it will be complete or the title or anything? Like yeah, uh, well, the temporary, I mean, the, the working title is Light from Darkness, um, okay. you know, Understanding Church Crises. And uh, it is, again, Catholic Answers, hopefully uh, it might come out towards the end of this year in the fall, mm -hmm. but it might be a spring uh, 2022 book, uh, depending on how Catholic, first of all, I have to finish it, but I'm very close to being done with it here over the next couple of weeks, uh, get it to them, and then we'll go through the editing process and whatnot. So it, it might be tight. For this fall it might be next spring but that's up to catholic answers but yeah look forward uh look for that coming out here soon i i look forward to that and i think that's going to help a lot of people because a lot of people are really confused right now they're very concerned about the crisis in the church and i think a historian's perspective on the long term to this i, I think that's an awesome idea i really look forward to that um whenever that comes out please come on the show and let's let's talk about it i think that would be Absolutely. awesome yeah, yeah i think it's really good because a, a, a lot of people um their expectations uh, especially converts to catholicism um their expectations are not really historically calibrated so they're so they're not so they see the church veering off into uh scandals and the variances that it's going through right now and they think that not only is it unprecedented, but if this is really Christ's church, this would never happen. Right. But if you get if you get calibrated to the history of the church, you realize that um, for some mysterious reason, God, like the life of Job, has allowed the church at different times to uh, really, really go through storms. Yeah. No, very true. Very true. Yep, absolutely. Right. All right. Well, once again, uh, Professor Weidenkopf, it was an honor having you on. I would love to have you on again in the future uh, whenever the book comes out with Catholic Answers. So we'll we'll see you again hopefully soon. Uh, but Eric, 
Thank you for coming on, Professor. Thank you for coming on. Everybody in the chat, thank you all for your participation. Uh, you were very engaged and also had uh, great questions. Don't forget to check us out also at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us and also comment, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Until next time, God bless. Thank you, guys. God bless.